So greetings from Pennsylvania once again. We're not out in the woods today, maybe a little bit later, but here in Easton, all the way here in Eastern Pennsylvania, where the Delaware and the Lehigh Rivers meet. We're going to talk about the Treaty of Easton that occurred in October of 1758 during the French and Indian War. So I am currently trying to find the center of town where some monuments are, but I left my phone at home. So, you know, I usually use Google Maps sometimes to figure out where I'm going, so that's okay. We'll figure it out. But yeah, but this treaty, this treaty did not end the war, the French and Indian War. This was a treaty between the British colonials and the Native American tribes of the area. It did play an important role during 1758, especially during the Forbes campaign, which is coming up soon on this channel. That was where the British did capture Fort Duquesne out in Western PA. But this treaty played an important role in that, in them being able to capture it. But I want to get to the town center first. Since we're doing the Treaty of Easton, I thought we would come to Easton, try to find the, some of the memorials, the monuments for it. All right, if I can. As you know, town is not my favorite place to be, but we'll, we'll figure it out. So I'm pretty sure I need to go over that way more. And that looks like an old house right there. Right in the midst of the rest of town here. This is an old place. It was around during the 1750s. So at some point I'll tell you what this treaty entailed, but probably not here in town. I'll probably try to find a quieter spot to tell you what the treaty was between the two different, between the British colonials and the Native Americans. But like I said, I think we'll wait till we find a quieter, less distracting place for that. Well, let's see if we can find a town center. All right, so I think I found it up ahead. It's more like a circular, one of those roundabouts up here. You can see some of the, like the memorial tower up there, I guess you could call it. But yeah, a lot of the native, a lot of the treaties between the Native Americans and the colonials occurred here in Easton. Here's a historical sign, not dealing with what we're doing today, but Samuel Phillip, recognized as the inventor of the split bamboo fishing rod. Interesting. Uh, I don't know if we're actually gonna be able to get in there. Look, they got all kinds of construction going on here. Okay, that's a bummer. That's where we want to be, is in there. Um, okay, let's figure this out. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to get over there or not. That's where we want to be, is in there, but there's been all kinds of work in here. Everything's like fenced off. We'll see though, we'll try. I'm not sure. All right, let's figure this out. Yeah, so this is as close as we're gonna get. They're actually, they're placing all the sidewalks, the paving around the monument and everything. Somewhere up there is a plaque commemorating these treaties, the Treaty of Easton, but uh, not gonna make it there today. All right, so we're gonna head out of Easton, but I, knew, I do need to talk about what happened during this Treaty of Easton, what it entails, because it does play a major impact on the Forbes campaign. Because without it, the Forbes campaign may not have been as successful as it was in capturing Fort Duquesne. It did play a big part in that campaign. All right, let's get out of here. Find a quieter spot. All right, so we have made it out of Easton. A little beautiful little park here. And what have we here? A covered bridge. We'll be filming that later. You can guess where I am if you want to. Some of you might recognize the spot, but I'm gonna sit down, have a quick lunch here, and we'll get back to the video. All right, so lunch is consumed. Time to talk about the treaty itself. Because I just also hear all this, like this loud crackling noise. I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up, but I'm walking underneath these power lines. So it's kind of a disturbing sound. The sound of the electricity flowing through those wires. But yeah, let's talk about the treaty itself. So this is called the Treaty of Easton because it took place, I stated, in this town of Easton there. I should mention that that's a pretty neat town there. A lot of history there. Kind of unfortunate that we couldn't get to where the plaques and the monuments are. I would have liked to 
I've read some of those to you. Just walk around. Look, look pretty cool. But you know what? They're they're fixing the place up there. Looks like they're placing all the sidewalks and the, the paving bricks and everything. So, but it is what it is sometimes. But anyway, but back to the treaty. And with any treaty, usually there's concessions made by both sides. And this treaty was no different. So we'll talk about the treat some of the concessions that were made by the the British colonials first. So we'll go over, like I said, some of the concessions made by the British colonials first. The first one was to give back some land that they obtained during what was called the Walking Purchase of 1737. Let's just say some funny business that kind of occurred during that purchase. Uh, it was, the Indians agreed to give them some land as, you know, it was determined by how far a man could walk in two days. They could get that much land, but of course the, the colonials kind of took advantage of that had who had the guy that was walking the, the distance actually run so he they obtained a lot more land than the, the Native Americans were anticipating that they would obtain in that purchase so they were not happy about that that's one of the reasons why they fought with the French during the during the French and Indian War so that was one concession they agreed to give back one was to recognize the hunting rights of the Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley and the last one was to they promised not to settle put settlements west of the Allegheny Mountains. So those were the concessions made by the British colonials. But as with all uh, treaties I've seen to be made by our government and the British government and other governments when it comes to Native Americans, I don't really know that they ever fully um, intended to keep those concessions or to honor those concessions, because they obviously didn't. I mean, we obviously ended up settling west of the Allegheny Mountains. Allegheny Mountains start kind of in central PA, so the idea was that we would not settle past that. Well, we didn't, we didn't honor that, um, things like that. So, but anyway, it is what it is. I kind of wonder too, at, at what point, you know, from a Native American perspective, at what point do you stop making treaties with people who don't honor those treaties? So, but anyway. And then of course, there would also be several concessions made by the Native American tribes. I think there are 13 groups that were present at that treaty including you know, some of the different Iroquois tribes, the Shawnee, the Lenape, a whole variety of them. One concession was that they give up the, all their land in, New, in what was today present-day New Jersey. I think that affected mostly the Lenape tribes. They agreed to concede all that land to the British colonials. So that was the one concession. And the one that pertains to this video, most importantly, is the second concession they made was that they agreed not to fight alongside the French for the rest of the duration of the war that was going on, which we today call the French and Indian War. So that's the one that was important for this case. So the second concession is the one that was most important in some ways for the French and Indian War and this video, because Forbes' campaign was going on at that time during 1758 to take Fort Duquesne, but per their agreement, the Indians would not fight alongside the French to hold on to Fort Duquesne, which, is, which is, was very important for that campaign. Because you remember when we did Braddock's campaign that occurred back in 1755, three years earlier than Forbes' campaign, you know, that one ended in utter disaster. You know, at the Battle of Monongahela, you know, Braddock was utterly defeated, but it was a combined force of French and Indians that defeated him. You know, there was more Native Americans fighting in that battle than there were French. If I remember the numbers correctly, there were three to 400 French maybe, but 600 to 900 Native Americans fought. So if the Native Americans hadn't been there, maybe Braddock wouldn't have lost that battle either. Who knows? But so the Native Americans, so during Forbes' campaign, the Native Americans were not allied with the French anymore. So that made a huge difference in that campaign. So the French at Fort Duquesne knew that the British were going to be attempting making another effort to retake that fort. So they knew, the, they knew Forbes was coming. But this time, they didn't have the Native Americans allying with them. They wouldn't be fighting with them. So instead of waiting for Forbes and his army to reach the fort and putting them under siege and everything, the French, who knew they were outnumbered, because remember, they, they didn't have their Native American allies anymore, they just they abandoned the fort and burned it to the ground. So when Forbes and his army arrived, they didn't have to fight to retake the fort. It was already abandoned by the French. But like I said, if that treaty hadn't happened, the Native Americans were still allied with the French. 
that whole scenario might have taken quite a different turn. When Forbes and his men arrived, they might have found a you know a larger you know a large force of French and Native Americans waiting for them. They might have had to do a long-term siege of the fort to take it. Might have been a lot of fighting. Things could, they still might have been able to retake the fort, maybe not, but things would have been a little bit different. But we'll never know how that history could have turned out because the treaty did happen. The Indians did abandon their alliance with the French, and the French thus then abandoned the, the fort, Fort Duquesne, because they realized that they didn't have enough men to hold out against the whole British army that was showing up. Not that, the, not that it was a huge force, but they didn't have enough men since they lost their allies with the Native Americans. But it is intriguing to consider or to think about what would have happened. What if that treaty didn't take place? What happened? What would have happened if Forbes, when Forbes and his army arrived within the vicinity of Fort Duquesne, and there was a still a force of French and a larger force of Native Americans there defending the fort? You know, how would things have gone? Because to be honest, things hadn't been going so well for Forbes' campaign. They were hoping to be done by late summer or early fall, but here they were into November and they're still making their way to Fort Duquesne. The winter was coming. They, you know, trying to take, do a siege to Fort Duquesne during the harsh winter months was not something they had intended and something that they were not prepared for, actually. So, kind of interesting to think what would happen, you know? But we'll never know, because things did happen the way they did, but it's just interesting sometimes to think, like I said, what, what would have happened, but like I said, we'll never know. So that is the Treaty of Easton. Like I said, not a, when it comes to the worldwide scope of world history, not the most important treaty in the world. It's not the treaty that ended the French and Indian War either. It, just, it was just between the British colonials and the Native Americans. But it did have a huge impact, like I said, on the Forbes campaign. But I think that'll be it for the Treaty of Easton. We've got a covered bridge to film next while we're here. But if you want to learn more about the Treaty of Easton, you can obviously look up more online about some of the finer details about it. But one of the person I want to mention is Conrad Weiser. We did a video on him some time ago. Actually, he, he lived not too far from where I live, there in Womelsdorf. But he was one of the main Indian interpreters there and was an arbitrator for them, to help them. So he could speak the language. I think he spoke Iroquois. So he was a big part of that treaty and other treaties that involved the colonials and the Native Americans. But we talked about him in a previous video. So yeah, I think that'll be it. As always, thanks for coming along and we'll see you on the next one.